Hi everyone and welcome to the first of our new video series called Be Inspired. Our first guest for the Be Inspired video is no one else other than the Women in Localization 2023 president, Carrie Fisher. Good morning, Carrie. Good morning. We chose you because not only you are the president of our localization women's organization, but you are an inspirational, authentic, and caring leader. You have led women in localization this year through solidifying our programs and reaching out more of our members. You have a 20-year career in localization, and you are a skilled, um, a very skilled at building teams. You are also a mother and an athlete. Is that correct, what I've said so far? You know what? I met 30 years in the loc industry. Can you stand it? Can you believe it? Do you consider yourself an ambitious person? Well, um, maybe we could define the word ambitious because it really, that can be a loaded word, you know, and perceived to have uh, different connotations in the context of men versus women. So my first response to the word ambitious is, uh, getting ahead, no matter what. But that's not the true definition. It is uh, having or showing a strong desire and determination to succeed. Um, so I have to say, yes, I am ambitious. I work very hard uh, to have a better life for my son and myself. In what way does that show up in your in your work and life? I take on projects that I'm not ready for. And maybe projects is the wrong word. I take on experiences that are brand new to me. Um, I reach kind of deep down inside and find the courage, which gives me confidence. Um, and, and that's, I think, the root of everything that I do. You have to have courage to move forward um, and be ambitious and fight. Did you have that early in life or you feel it's something that came with life experience, let's call it? It came with life experience. I was, you know, it's funny in my family, I was uh, the youngest of four girls and I was like the entertainer. <laughs> I love to, you know, put on a show, but only for family, you know, and uh, when it came to real life, I had zero confidence and it's only through life experiences, all the, you know, positions I've held. I've only been with four companies, believe it or not, but they helped me transform into the person I am today. And with that came confidence. And quite frankly, you know, I had to learn it and I read books about it and, you know, uh, tapped into things, you know, in my personal life that, that helped me get that confidence. I see. So, you know, we talk a lot about self-growth nowadays and growth mindset. This has become like a, a, a narrative of, of, of the corporate world, which is great. I mean, a lot of I hope that a lot of people feel more supported than, than ever. But it sounds like you naturally incorporated that in your life even before this became a, 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 a trend. Is that correct? I would say yes. Um, and being forced to speak in front of 200, 250 people. Uh, in my late 20s, uh, that's where, you know, you don't have a choice. <laughs> you get up on that stage and you give your presentation and uh, you tap into the, for me, it was the young kid entertainer. Um, and you tell funny stories to, you know, people don't want to sit there and listen to <laughs> you ramble about whatever's on your PowerPoint presentation. They want uh, to be engaged. And, and uh, so, Storytelling became uh, part of that as well. I was building the localization team at Hyperion Software, it was called at that point in time. I lived in Connecticut. This was in 98, I think, uh, 99. So I, I had built out the team nicely. Um, I was asked to kind of look at what would it take to bring everybody internally to the company, all the linguists, um, all the testers, you know, J.D. Edwards back in the day was one of the few, and Oracle uh, were one of the few companies that had internal teams to do all the translations for them. And uh, I was asked to 
do that for Hyperion to start, you know, to, to evaluate that and see if it, it made sense. And so I was going to Ireland at least once a month to look at places. Um, the government guys were, were driving me around everywhere, trying to find, you know, the talent that, because I, back in the day, that's where, that's where everybody was. Ireland was the localization center. Um, and at that point in time, it was cheaper than the United States, <laughs> but um, I had to give a presentation in front of the entire development department and IT um, just to give them an update on, on my progress. And that's when I had to speak in front of that whole, all those departments. And that was at least 250 people in that room. So what did you tell yourself when you had to go in front of them? I spent a lot of time in the bathroom beforehand, <laughs> uh, pumping myself up. You know, I needed to reach deep down inside, gain the confidence, gain the courage. And I did have a funny story to tell. I made sure to have a little bit of entertaining and it was, you know, it was a true story. It made me relax and uh, it made, the, I think, the, the presentation go better. Awesome. Yeah, that you're using humor a lot in your work and for yourself and for both in your working life and your personal life. Um, and again, you are very good at building teams and you have been building teams now for a long time. So I'm guessing humor is one of the ingredients on how you lead. Um, what else are the key ingredients of building teams, especially in this day when we're, we're, we're going through a lot? Historically, we had a pandemic. Um, how people are more focused on uh, growth and all these things. How do you keep, how do you build a team and keep it together? That's a good question. I never thought about it, but yeah, I do use humor. Um, I also employ, you know, listening and empathy. I think those are the two things that I think of uh, when building a team. You need to understand what makes the other people tick, what motivates them, how to tap into that. Um, because if, if, you know, if there's even one member on the team that gets demotivated, it can bring down the entire team. How do you deal with uh, different personalities? Maybe it's because I'm the youngest of four I, uh, kids. <laughs> I don't know. I. I love all personalities. I love um, I love taking the unhappy person, the curmudgeon, you know, the person who doesn't understand why we have to translate. Uh, why can't we just have everyone speak English? That doesn't happen anymore, but it it did happen in previous jobs. Um, I love taking that person and really working with them, helping them to understand the importance, the role that they play in the success of the company. I think like that helps people kind of turn it around and makes them part of the team and, and want to want to help. Um, but it does take patience and it takes uh, good listening skills and then connecting to that person. Maybe there's a, a you know, a, a similarity in their lifestyle that you can tap into oh you like running or oh you like tennis I do too you know as a leader do you ever get discouraged and when you do what do you do sure uh I can remember several times being discouraged uh I don't want to do this anymore I want to quit <laughs> um it's usually temporary and it's usually due to uh, some kind of misunderstanding, either on my part or someone else's part. I take the time to dissect um, why I'm feeling a certain way. Why am I down? Why am I, why is this not working? And then figure out a plan to build it back up. Sometimes I reach out to others in the industry, creating your network of five, 10 people, whatever, that you can go to with a problem, either personally or within a, you know the industry boundaries, 
and knowing that you're just going to get a straight answer. Um, somebody who knows you is important. Uh, and I've just found if you surround yourself with those people that can give it to you straight, um, direct communication helps you clarify what's really happening. Um, and then putting a plan in place to get yourself out of it. So we talked already, we started by talking about that word ambitious, which I like that you deconstructed and you questioned it. Um, I would like to go back a little to ask you, what does success represent for you? What does it mean? It can mean a lot of things for a lot of people. It does. My basic definition here is if you're happy with who you are, what you do, and what you stand for, you are successful. Absolutely. I happen to agree with that. And I hope through this series, uh, we're going to inspire women to redefine success that way. Of course, it's hard to do that when you're 20, when you are uncertain, uh, when you, do, you, you're not, you don't have self-confidence. And that was another question So uh, that I was thinking about. So um, we have a lot of young women in our organization and it's from the confidence of, a, of someone who has been through life. It's of course, we gain self-confidence through age also. So well, how, what would you tell someone, especially a woman who's at the beginning of their career, they're 20 something, they're, they're, they're driven, they do all the right things, but it's, they don't have the self-confidence that because they're very young, right? Um, what, how would you encourage them to look at themselves and to be able to picture themselves years from today with this self-confidence that we know it's gained only through life experience? Nowadays, I feel like we have lots of role models within mm -hmm. the localization industry. It's super important for the veterans. I'll just call them veterans. We're not old. We're veterans of the localization industry, I think it's our duty to help those who are just starting out in the localization industry. They could be new to the industry. They could be recent graduates. I feel like it's our duty to help them find their confidence, their courage by mentoring. I have two mentees. And one of them is just so similar to me, even though she lives in a completely different country. You know, she's in her mid twenties, actually early twenties. Um, but I see myself in her, you know, the um, self-deprecating, she just kind of wants to shrink sometimes into herself. Um, yet she is so smart and has great ideas. And I feel, it's really up to the people who have lived through it to help them. They, it's so important to listen and figure out what is making them shrink, you know, uh, from a challenge or feeling not good enough. And for me, my personal experience, I, it, for me, it unfortunately, you know, came from my, my mom, um, not my dad, who was very empowering and you know, had four girls and he's like, you will make your way in this world. You know, don't rely on a man. Um, or, uh, my mom was rather, um, are you going to wear that? Are you really going to wear that? What are you going to do with a French degree? How do you plan to even be successful? You know, it's, it was, it was her way of probably trying to give me confidence, but, uh, it probably had the opposite effect. And that's what I see in, um, Younger people sometimes, they've been told they can't do it or um, been put down by family or friends. And it's just up to us mentors to really help them through that and see that these people do not define who we are or who we become. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we should mention that we do have a great mentorship program with women in localization, mentorees, right? And you are one of the uh, mentors. It's, um, I will be. How lucky. I, I, I picked up these mentees through our previous mentorship program, but I'm going to sign up to mentor ease as well. Gary, 
Um, you do a lot of exercise, you play tennis, you go to the gym four times per week and you eat healthy. Um, so what is, what is your daily routine? <laughs> um, I do eat clean every day. So the first thing I do is drink eight ounces of water. First thing, as soon as I wake up, uh, come out to the kitchen, I drink my eight ounces of water because your body has been sleeping for, you know, six to eight hours, depending on how, how, how many hours of sleep you get. Um, it's dehydrated and you have to replenish that water intake. It also gives me, I think, energy. Um, like I said, meals are clean. I work out at night because that's when I have time. So you do exercise every day. You have that discipline. I do. And I don't, you know, the only time I didn't exercise is when I was sick, you know, or had COVID or whatever. Um, I don't make it a choice. It's not a choice. It is the lifestyle. And I just go. If you could name one stereotype about women um, that you try to tear it down through your work and life or life. Yeah, I think um, probably the mommy penalty mm -hmm. is the one that I hate the most. I think women can be put in a box uh, when they decide to have a family and can be dismissed altogether. You know, like, well, she's pregnant now. Let's not give her any hard projects or, you know, she won't be around to finish them. Or there she goes, leaving early again to pick up her sick kid. You know, some women take a year off and they find it hard to get a job after they've done the hardest job in the world. I remember interviewing someone for a senior project manager job when I was at Hyperion Solutions. It wasn't even for localization. I, it was for the development team because everyone liked my my hiring instincts, uh, my ability to trust my gut and, you know, really bring the best candidates forward for them. So I interviewed this woman and it felt she was qualified. She interviewed well. My gut instinct was telling me she's the one. I did see that there was a year that she didn't work and I didn't care. I didn't ask her about it. Um, and at the end of the interview process, she said, you haven't even asked me about this year you know, that I took off. And I said, well, it wasn't relevant to the job or your experience. Um, and by the way, we're benefiting you know, from all your experiencing uh, experience. And she just broke down into tears and and said, you know, I took a year off to have a baby and raise my daughter. And I've been dismissed from so many interviews because I chose this to take care of my daughter. And this is well before I had kids. I wasn't even married at the time. And I, I think I said, you know, I love that, you know, because of your daughter, you and your family probably benefited from that decision. But even today, you know, women, I feel, are penalized for choosing to have a family, and I, I just hate that. Thank you so much. This is very powerful, and it uh, literally gave, gave me chills while you were, were speaking. Um, and I hope more and more leaders get inspired by, by the example that you just provided uh, to allow for women to, to, um, to, to come back to where they can and they want. It's a, if, if they have that choice. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. What is one uh, women's cause that you feel close to and advocate for? Uh, overcoming female gender bias. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a, a motivated, a motivational speaker come to Subway. Her name uh, was Hillary Bass. This was a few years ago. And she talked about the female gender bias and ways to overcome it. And it was a huge eye opener to me. Um, and so, of course, I immediately asked her if she would give the exact same presentation for a global community event, uh, and she did. So if, if you do go into our website and look at our videos tab on the website and search for bias, a Hillary Bass presentation shows up because um, we're still making less than men <laughs> we do. Uh, for this bias, and we're doing the same job, and it's just not right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let, let's encourage people to go to the website and and listen to the to that amazing webinar uh, presentation. Yeah, that's great. I have a few questions, rapid fire questions, and I would like to wrap up with that. Um, so, tell us a quote that resonates with you and why. 
You are what you eat. What book is on your nightstand? Um, I haven't started it yet, but I, I have it here next to me and I'll, I'll show it to you. It's He's not from our industry, which I think is interesting, but it's called America's Bilingual Century by, uh, by Steve Levine. He was one of the keynote speakers at ALC in Portland back in uh, September. I didn't actually see the keynote. Uh, I met him afterwards and we had a great conversation and I, I wanted to buy his book uh, to understand more about it. But, um, you know, he it takes a different approach and I I, I like that. Uh, I want someone from outside the industry talking about bilingualism in America. I, I need to read that. So uh, it's, awesome. it's next on my list. <laughs> That's great. Last question. What personality would you have dinner with and why? I love uh, I love someone who has uh, is more knowledgeable than I am. That doesn't sound right. I love someone who has knowledge about an industry that I don't know anything about. I love to learn about different things outside of the localization industry. And I also love somebody who can laugh at himself and that's or, or laugh at themselves. Right? Could be a man or a woman. That's that's important to me. Well, thank you, Carrie, very much. This was a wonderful interview. I learned a lot about you and our audience will as well. Uh, and thank you so much again for leading us so wonderfully this year at Women in Localization. Thank you for having me.